Learn more about John Wesley's scriptural Christianity in this episode of Standing with Wesley. Welcome to this episode of Standing with Wesley. We begin with Jesus' words as recorded by Matthew. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now in this verse, where it says the smallest letter, or in some translations, jot, is the Hebrew letter yod, which is the smallest of the Hebrew letters. And the least stroke, or tittle, is a small mark on a Hebrew letter that either distinguishes it from a similar Hebrew letter or simply decorates that particular letter. We've seen that John Wesley believed that the Holy Scriptures of the Bible are the only true authoritative source for religious knowledge. In this episode, we want to look at what John Wesley believed about the integrity of Scripture and what that means for us today. We begin by looking at the words of John Wesley himself. In the preface to his explanatory notes upon the New Testament, John Wesley wrote, Concerning the scriptures in general, what we now style the Holy Scripture, this is that word of God which remaineth forever, of which, though heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle shall not pass away. The scripture, therefore, of the Old and New Testament is a most solid and precious system of divine truth. Every part thereof is worthy of God, and all together are one entire body, wherein is no defect, no excess. An exact knowledge of the truth was accompanied in the inspired writers with an exactly regular series of arguments, a precise expression of their meaning, and a genuine vigor of suitable affections. In the language of the sacred writings, we may observe the utmost depth, together with the utmost ease. All the elegancies of human composure sink into nothing before it. God speaks not as man, but as God. His thoughts are very deep, and thence his words are of inexhaustible virtue. And the language of his messengers also is exact in the highest degree, for the words which were given them accurately answered the impression made upon their minds. In a letter to the Bishop of Gloucester, Wesley quotes the bishop and then responds, The bishop had written, but how did he inspire the scripture? He so directed the writers that no considerable error should fall from them. Wesley replied, nay. Will not the allowing there is any error in scripture shake the authority of the whole? In a journal entry for August 24, 1776, John Wesley wrote, I read Mr. Janine's admired tract on the internal evidence of the Christian religion. He is undoubtedly a fine writer, but whether he is a Christian, deist, or atheist, I cannot tell. If he is a Christian, he betrays his own cause by averring that all scripture is not given by inspiration of God, but the writers of it were sometimes left to themselves, and consequently made some mistakes. Nay, if there be any mistakes in the Bible, there may as well be a thousand. If there be one falsehood in that book, it did not come from the God of truth. Let's look at some of the commentary that John Wesley made in his explanatory notes upon the Old Testament. In Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, Wesley commented, pure, without the least mixture of falsehood, and therefore shall infallibly be fulfilled. Psalm 19, 7, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Wesley wrote, sure, Hebrew, faithful or true which is most necessary in a witness, 
It will not mislead any man, but will infallibly bring him to happiness. Psalm 19.8 The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Wesley, pure, without the least mixture of error. Psalm 119.96 Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Wesley, commandment, thy word, one part of it being put for the whole. Broad or large, both for extent and for continuance. It is useful to all persons. It is of everlasting truth and efficacy. It will never deceive those who trust to it, as all worldly things will, but will make men happy both here and forever. Psalm 119.129 Your testimonies are wonderful. Wesley, wonderful. In regard of the deep mysteries, the most excellent directions, and the exceeding great and precious promises of God contained in them. Psalm 119, 140. Your word is very pure, Wesley, pure, without the least mixture of falsehood. Isaiah 40, verses 6 and 8. A voice says, Call out. Then he answered, What shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. But the word of our God stands forever. Wesley, all flesh. The prophet, having foretold glorious things, confirms the certainty of them by representing the vast difference between the nature and word and work of men and of God. All that men are or have, yea, their highest accomplishments, are but like the grass of the field, weak and vanishing, soon nipped and brought to nothing. But God's word is like himself, immutable and irresistible, and therefore as the mouth of the Lord and not of man hath spoken these things. So doubt not, but they shall be fulfilled. And from Wesley's explanatory notes upon the New Testament, John 10.35, And the scripture cannot be broken. Wesley, And the scripture cannot be broken, that is, Nothing which is written therein can be censured or rejected. Romans 7.12 So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Wesley, the commandment, that is, every branch of the law, is holy, and just, and good. It springs from, and partakes of, the holy nature of God. It is every way just and right in itself. It is designed wholly for the good of man. 1 Timothy 1.8 But we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Wesley We grant the whole Mosaic law is good, answers excellent purposes, if a man use it in a proper manner. Even the ceremonial is good as it points to Christ, and the moral law is holy, just, and good on its own nature and of admirable use both to convince unbelievers and to guide believers in all holiness. 1 Peter 2, 2 Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word. Wesley, the milk of the word, that word of God which nourishes the soul as milk does the body, and which is sincere, pure from all guile, so that none are deceived who cleave to it. Although John Wesley never used the word inerrant to refer to the Holy Scriptures, he did use the word infallible, and in many places he referred to the Scriptures being without error. It doesn't seem that John Wesley would have been uncomfortable with using the term inerrant to refer to the integrity of the Holy Scriptures. And many modern Wesleyan scholars have been comfortable with using that term. The Evangelical Theological Society was formed by evangelical scholars in 1949 with the sole doctrinal statement that all members have to affirm each year the Bible alone and the Bible in its entirety is the Word of God written and is therefore inerrant in the autographs. Later, to maintain orthodoxy, it added another doctrinal statement, God is a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each an uncreated person, one in essence, equal in power and glory. The words in its logo are the original Greek text of Jesus' words in John 10.35, the scripture cannot be broken, or in Greek, 
Udunate Luthene He Grafe. At least two Wesleyan scholars have served as president of the Evangelical Theological Society, both professors at Asbury Theological Seminary. In 1955, Harold Barnes Kuhn, Professor of Philosophy of Religion, and in 2020, Craig S. Keener, Professor of New Testament, and many other Wesleyan scholars, some of whom are listed here, have been or are members of the Evangelical Theological Society, clearly affirming the inerrancy of the entire Bible. Now, it's important to recognize that this inerrancy applies to the original autographs, the documents as first authored by the authors of Scripture, not to those documents that were copies in which some errors may have been introduced by the copyists. Thirty years after the forming of the Evangelical Theological Society, scholars met in Chicago to make a formal statement of how biblical inerrancy should be understood. This resulted in a short statement a series of more detailed statements, and an exposition of their findings and agreement. The exposition part of their statement on infallibility, inerrancy, and interpretation reads in part, Holy Scripture, as the inspired Word of God, witnessing authoritatively to Jesus Christ, may properly be called infallible and inerrant. These negative terms have a special value, for they explicitly safeguard crucial positive truths. Infallible signifies the quality of neither misleading nor being misled, and so safeguards, in categorical terms, the truth that Holy Scripture is a sure, safe, and reliable rule and guide in all matters. Similarly, Inerrant signifies the quality of being free from all falsehood or mistake, and so safeguards the truth that Holy Scripture is entirely true and trustworthy in all its assertions. We affirm that canonical Scripture should always be interpreted on the basis that it is infallible and inerrant. However, in determining what the God-taught writer is asserting in each passage, we must pay the most careful attention to its claims and character as a human production. In inspiration, God utilized the culture and convention of his penman's milieu, a milieu that God controls in his sovereign providence. It is misinterpretation to imagine otherwise. So history must be treated as history, poetry as poetry, hyperbole and metaphor as hyperbole and metaphor, generalization and approximation as what they are, and so forth. Differences between literary conventions in Bible times and in ours must also be observed, since, for instance, non-chronological narration and imprecise citation were conventional and acceptable and violated no expectations in those days. We must not regard these things as faults when we find them in Bible writers. When total precision of a particular kind was not expected nor aimed at, it is no error not to have achieved it. Scripture is inerrant, not in the sense of being absolutely precise by modern standards, but in the sense of making good its claims and achieving that measure of focused truth at which its authors aimed. About 300 scholars signed the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy in January 1979. Vic Reasoner, in his book The Importance of Inerrancy, notes that nine Wesleyan scholars were among those who signed this document, affirming their faith in the inerrancy and infallibility of Holy Scripture. As Christians, we're entitled to use some term to describe our belief in the integrity of the Holy Scriptures, and inerrant seems to be an appropriate term, especially when we remember that many Christian terms need to be qualified to be understood accurately. For example, we talk about the Trinity. We don't mean three gods. We mean three persons in one Godhead. When we talk about rebirth or regeneration, we're talking about a spiritual rebirth, not a second physical rebirth. Similarly, when we talk about the Holy Scriptures as being inerrant. We're saying that they accurately communicate what God meant to say to us.
Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 and 11 are important verses concerning the nature of the Word of God. Through Isaiah the Lord said, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. In his commentary on the book of Isaiah, John Oswald wrote, In a powerful comparison, Isaiah says that God's word is just like the rain. In particular, he compares the effectiveness of the two. Each one achieves the purposes of blessing and life-giving for which it was intended. Throughout the book of Isaiah, this idea of God's pre-existent purpose and the certainty of its accomplishment have been a central idea. Coupled with that is the idea of God's having spoken in intelligible terms. Put together, these constitute the basis of the biblical doctrine of special revelation. God has spoken to reveal his plans and purposes in the context of human history, and what he has said will be accomplished. Above everything else, these plans and purposes are for good. God intends to bless the human race, to forgive its sins, to redeem its failures, and to give permanence to its work. All this will be accomplished through his revelatory word. The power of the word and its content are inseparable. It is because what God says is the truth that the word will perform exactly what God intends. So Isaiah highlights the whole concept of God's purpose for his word in each part of his word and what he intends to accomplish as a result of it. When we find what God intends to communicate to us, we will find that his word is inerrant and the guidance he gives is infallible. However, whenever God's word is misinterpreted and misapplied, no such claim can be made. Some contend that we cannot understand the scriptures today as we did in the past because of modern science. We'll save a more in-depth discussion of the relationship between science and the Bible for another time. For now, it's important for us to consider three important points. First of all, when people wrote or spoke in biblical times, they did so from their own culture, their own perspective and understanding of the world. That's not necessarily what God meant to communicate to us through those scriptures. And here's where scholars who study the times in which these scriptures were written, the languages in which they were written, the idioms of the time, help us to separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of what God is saying and what was merely the way in which these people were communicating. Secondly, it's important to understand that when the scriptures do speak about the natural world, what they say is absolutely accurate and true. And finally, the most important thing that the scriptures teach about the natural world is that everything that exists other than God was created by God, exists by His will, and is sustained by His will. This is taught in both Testaments and is a basic truth that underlies all of Scripture, everything that Scripture says and teaches, and is one of the most important things for us to understand about God. He is the only one with self-existence. Everything else exists because He created it and is therefore sovereign over it. Thomas Oden notes that for John Wesley, each particular text of Scripture is best read by analogy with other correlated passages of Scripture and with the whole course of scriptural teaching and in relation to the history of its consensual interpretation by the great teachers of Scripture. By this means one allows the clear texts to illuminate obscure texts. This is the principle of the analogy of faith, analogy of fide, which in accord with classic Christian exegesis, Wesley constantly sought to employ. Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. One begins to accumulate through the study of Scripture a sense of the wholeness of faith 
as one text illuminates another. Scriptural wisdom comes out of a broadly based dialogue with the general sense of the whole of Scripture, not a single set of selected texts. In the worshiping community, we bring previous memories of Scripture's address to each subsequent reading. In closing, let's think about the result of John Wesley's confidence in the integrity of Scripture. John Wesley's recognition of the integrity of all Scripture enabled him to understand the whole counsel of God, and as a result, to be effective as a minister and to bring to us the most accurate theology that has come from any Christian teacher through the ages. My book, Walking with a Full Assurance of Understanding, was written to aid students of God's Word. It incorporates Wesleyan insights as well as information that will help you avoid misunderstandings of the teaching of Scripture that are all too common today. My book is available from booksellers worldwide, and many have a look inside feature. In addition, there is a book trailer on this channel for those who want to learn more. In our next episode, we'll continue our discussion of John Wesley's Scriptural Christianity. I hope you join us. Mm -hmm.